All right, so this is going to be a conversation. How does that sound? So some of you, this is your second time with me today. Raise your hand. Who's the second time? Okay, so almost all of you. All right, so Chief, come on up here. We'll address you guys together. Okay, so first off, I can tell a second war uh, story, or you guys can just go right into um, whatever's on your mind. So what are we doing? You want another war story? Japan. Okay, all right. Okay, so there I was. Very good. Yes, all right. Okay, so my role in Japan was, first off, I was just stationed there for three years. Myself and your colonel, Arianas, were stationed there at the same time. And we didn't know each other, right? But I did that for three years. I was an operations group exec. I was a weapons officer, kind of did the standard tour. And I really loved it. One thing about Kadena is that you know that you are doing the mission every day. You're not practicing to do the mission doing mission. And I would go up to Korea and build the war plans for Korea and that kind of thing. Okay. So I get back to the United States, I go to Kansas and don't think about Japan again. Okay? Until I get the next job. The next job was the joint staff officer to negotiate issues between Japan and the United States on behalf of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Alright? I am a whopping major at the time. What? You know, what major is going to be the negotiator for the chairman? I couldn't believe it. I said, so where is the continuity book? There is no continuity book. And how much time did I get with the person that I replaced? How much time do you guys get between your replacements and you? Uh, lucky if it's a day, man. Right. At all. <laughs> right. So the only Japanese culture I know is what I gleaned off of Okinawa. And if you guys know anything about Okinawa, they were a U.S. territory at one time. Did you guys know that? They, we gave them back to Japan in 1974. And it was such a momentous occasion that they shut down all the roads one day, switched the driving pattern, right? Because Japan drives on the other side of the road. They switched all the signs, opened up the next day as a territory of Japan, okay? So is Okinawan post-American? Are they Okinawan or are they Japan, Japanese? Well, it depends on who you talk to, okay? And Okinawa will tell you that that political angst is something that they deal with every day. They absolutely love having the 13 American bases that are on that little island. They absolutely love hosting them. But to their public, we are a burden to them. They absolutely enjoy the benefits of being part of Japan because guess what? That means they've got the Americans there to protect them. But they will rally against Japan because of all the prefixtures. Prefixtures, they are ranked number 67 of 68 prefixtures in Japan. So that means they get zero attention. So when they want to get Japanese attention from the Japanese government in Tokyo, they will use us as a burden to get the attention of their capital, okay? It's just, it's a dynamic, right? How many of you have those kind of dynamics in your state? Anybody from Illinois? Okay, so there's really two Illinois, right? Yes, ma'am. There's Chicago and everything else, yes, right? <laughs> so if you wanna get noticed in the southern part of Illinois, you gotta make some kind of noise to get over the Chicago noise, right? Am I, am I reading that wrong? No, ma'am. Yeah. Think of that when you think of Japan. Okay, so I've given you the setup of the political structure, right? Okay, so we have an airfield in this southern city of Naha, and it's a marine airfield. And over time, since World War II, child care development centers have developed right on the outside of the gate. Clubs on the outside of the gate. Art studios, dance studios, lots of kid things right around the gate. There's so much encroachment for my 13 mic in the room. There's so much encroachment there that we are one F-15 crash away from a major international incident with Japan. And in fact, during my time there, we had two F-15s go engine out completely, dead stick, over Naha. And luckily we had two of our most experienced pilots be able to land that safely. 
but they came in, no engine. They got that started right at the right at mine. That could have been a bad accident. So for a long time, since basically the early 1990s, the American government has been trying to get a new runway in the northern part of Okinawa, and it's called Potema, is the old one. We call this one New Potema, or FRF, Potema Replacement Facility. And so at the beginning, when we gave Japan a price tag, and why did we give Japan a price tag instead of paying for it ourselves? What's the deal there? Anybody know? Yeah? We had to support the National Defense Bank. Exactly right. Their defense force is what type of a defense force? Self-defense. Japan only has a military to defend their, themselves. They're not allowed to do collective defense, which means, let's say that, they, that China has done something so heinous that Japan needs to act. By their constitution, they cannot go attack China. They have us for that. We are their extended defensive force. So if somebody does something to Japan, they can do what they can to self-defend, but they cannot do collective defense to go against a country that has done something against their values. They have the best nuclear force in the world. Did you know that? Because it's ours, <laughs> right? They use our nukes. So that's why Japan should pay for that airfield. Right? And the first price tag that we gave them was $10 billion. Well, Okinawa is not exactly wild about the fact that a portion of their beautiful coastline should be made into a runway for the United States. They absolutely want us out of Naha. They want that land back today. And they want a bunch of other bases back today as well. So we negotiated with them that we would give about six bases worth of um, land back because their population is growing like crazy, like ours is, right? And we'd give them that land back if they gave us that runway up north. And oh, by the way, we take a bunch of Marines and put them on the wall because there's a lot of Marines on Okinawa, a lot. So they wanted to reduce Okinawa's burden, but Okinawa did not want to give up that coastline. So they have been using that to not only get that base put somewhere else, but to get better schools, to get better self-government, to get better aid, to get better roads. So they were trying to leverage this project with Home Japan so that they could benefit more from it. You know what? That is politics. I don't think that's evil. I think it's smart. $10 billion is what that field replacement facility was first. So I'm part of that negotiation team, right? And I will tell you, the hardest thing, and this is the leadership lesson I really want to drive home to you, is that I worked my tail off in that with State Department, with the Secretary of Defense's staff, with sometimes the Department of Commerce's staff, and we worked hard to get this replacement facility on the books moving forward. And we're there, right? Japan's getting ready to pay the money. They're getting ready to break the ground. And what happens, do you think? We have a Marine, drunk drive, kill an Okinawa. What do you think happens to all that progress we made over here? Anybody got an answer? Complete. Yeah, wiped it away. You guys are about to go out into your respective walks of life. Some of you will make it over the goal line and become part of the Air Force, Navy, you name it, right? Some of you will go out into the defense industry. Some of you will go out into a walk of life elsewhere, but a better citizen because you were a part of this group. Regardless, you have to understand where your individual responsibility, when we're talking about international relationships, where it is so critical. One small infraction can have fourth, fifth, sixth order impacts that can unravel the relationships that we have when it comes to defense with other nations. All right? So I told a story yesterday over at Ohio State about being in Cameroon where I had a major come up 
during a press conference that I was having with the governor of the city of Douala, Cameroon, where he was about to give me bad news. And the cameras were there because it was such a big event for Douala that they were recording it to put it on the news. And I had a major come up in a wife beater shirt. Have you guys ever heard those? You know what those are, right? Right. Do I have anybody by using that term? Okay. So this wife beater shirt, right? And long basketball shorts, right? He's kind of looking like, you know, I mean, he's standing out amongst the Cameroonians, right? Because, yeah. And he comes sauntering up while the cameras are right here, and I'm with the governor of the city, and the joint staff member who's in his ceremonial blues for the Cameroonian army. And he comes up and he goes, hey, dude, you want to swap rank? Right in front of the cameras. What do you think I did to that poor major? What I should have done, right? I took his knees out, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have to really be policing yourself when you're out in those communities. Now, is that only overseas? No, guys, no. How much percent of our nation has worn the uniform? Less than, right? Less than 1%. And there's going to be some communities that are super military friendly. And then there's going to be some that are not. And you may be in a case where you approach a, a family in uniform that may have not had a great experience with somebody in the uniform. You never know who you're going to encounter. So that self-responsibility is something I want you to take away from this conversation. International relationships, you are going to be the <coughs> spokesperson way before you think you should be. I was the senior US person signing treaties over in Cameroon as a colonel, because the embassy didn't want to come down and do it. That could happen. You just don't know. But that's the good thing about this career, too. You get to do some cool things like that. And you're going to get to do it all over the world. I don't think Chief has heard me tell a story about Iraq. Afghanistan, or any of the normal characters that we talk about when we talk about where we've been over the last 30 years. That's because I have had the opportunity to have missions well beyond just those. Lots of places. You get to do that. All right. So we have kind of the same crowd from this morning, Chief. So we can continue on with some questions and answers if you so, like. Yes, ma'am. All right. Is that what you guys would like to do? Or is there a topic you'd like to talk on or debate on? even better. <laughs> <laughs> Who's my first gracious volunteer to get this conversation going? You're getting three doses of me today. Oh my gosh, you're going to be so ready to see me go. <laughs> go ahead, sir. Um, you're, you're up. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, can I, Devin Napsiger, can I fourth class? Who is the most influential person in your career? Ooh, okay. Chief. I will tell you, for me, is actually she a retired chief. Um, why she, uh, I was a young staff sergeant, and what I learned from her, she was a, a chief master sergeant. She always took the back step and kind of provided us the guidance and let us fail. I failed multiple times under her leadership, but she was always there to support me and told me that, hey, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. That's how you learn. Uh, just being able, knowing that even though I knew I was going to mess up, but she was always going to be there to guide me and support me. So, and she, uh, her name is Chief Master Sergeant Retire. Um, Maria Cornelia. So. And she actually did my promotion to chief, even though. Oh, let's see. Yes. Yes, sir. Who's yours? My captain. All three of them. Oh, it's so diplomatic. Okay, so let me see if I can guess which one it is. If you're thinking about your captains and your most fondest memory comes about, what is that memory? <laughs> I go, I'm the wing executive, so I go to a lot of uh, staff action meetings and probably Captain Evan Glenn there has been very on top of things with wing staff. Especially. Oh, you could have just said Captain Glenn too and made me guess. That was awesome. Okay. That's good, right? Yes. Yeah, it kind of impacted you that day. Did you tell him? No. You know what? <laughs> that is the case though, right? I get emails every once in a while by somebody that... I haven't thought about in a while. And they'll tell me a story about, you said this thing, and you might not have even think, you didn't, might not have even thought that it meant something. 
but it did. You're, that's gonna happen to you, my friend. So it's okay to tell the Mr. Flynn that he is impacting you. Because I gotta tell you, you just made him have the energy to go on for 100 more of you. So <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I've been dodging the question on it. All right, so my, um, my most impactful leader would be Major General James Vetri, retired, Lieutenant General, excuse me, Lieutenant General, um, and the reason why. So he was my wing commander when I was having my babies. So I had Luke Mayer when I was a major, and I had Nick Mayer as a result of right after a deployment. That is the magic key for all of you. Um, uh, and I had Nick Mayer 15 months later. And I will never forget that uh, the job I had was called XP, okay? I was the wing XP, which is plans and programs. So that kind of means that for everything that my boss wants to do long term or for all of our war missions, I'm in charge of making sure that all the planning and all of the resources and infrastructure are ready to go so that we could go at a minute's notice. Okay, kind of a big job. And so I was his XP and he'd always have these meetings like at 5.30 at night. Well, if you don't know anything about the daycare system, right, you take your kids and you drop them off at daycare and there's this point in the day where if you're not there to pick them up, the bad man comes and gets your kids, right? And then you're the bad lady for not getting your kids. And that was six o'clock in Wichita. If I did not get my kids at six o'clock, the social workers would come, okay? And so he'd have these meetings at 5.30. Well, when does that mean that the meeting ends? Six, 6.30, you name it, right? So it got to a point where I just couldn't handle that stress anymore about worrying about, I had to leave the building at 5.51 and hope that all the lights were green so that I could get my kid before the bad man came, okay? And so I finally screwed up my courage and I said, sir, I need you to let me leave at 5.51. Otherwise, I am just stressed out and I can't even concentrate on what you're saying. I've gotta be able to walk out and go get my kids. Number one, he said, of course, why didn't you tell me before? And then the second thing was, he didn't, he tried real hard not to have those meetings where I need to be there for the, so late in the day. There are a thousand people that will line up to help you if you just ask. How many of you are comfortable asking for help? Hey, that's pretty good. Because I'd say not very many hands go up if they're being real about it. <coughs> Most of them feel like I gotta stay compartmentalized, I gotta stay composed, I gotta be perfect, I can't show weakness, I can't show vulnerability. I gotta tell you, you will miss out. In negotiations, if you just are grateful that somebody offered you money, you will have left money on the table. Ask for more money. If you need something for your airmen, Go ask everybody you can. Because if you don't ask, it doesn't come. Guess what happened today? I asked for something on behalf of the cadre. I think they got it. But we went and asked. So one more thing on him. When I became a colonel, and they, have you ever heard of a PRF? A promotion recommendation form? Okay, so that's what you get when your bosses think that you are worthy of being promoted. They write a form up for you. Well, I was a two-year colonel. And uh, happy as can be, doing my job. And I get this email from the four star of my command, General Everhart, that says, congratulations, we just gave you a definite promote for general. And I'm like, oh, that's a joke, right? I've only been a colonel for two years. So I actually went out to my exec. I said, hey, I got this email from the four star. He sent it out to the wrong person. He obviously doesn't know where I am in my career. And so, you know. Uh, when he calls and says, oh, sorry, I messed up, just tell him, yep, I got a good laugh at it and we're good to go. I honestly thought it was a joke. And then I got told, no, it's that time. So I called up General Vetri, Cole called him as a three-star in Africa. I'm gonna go, I don't know what's happening to me now. Because that, at that rank, it gets real mysterious about well, how you get promoted and what's expected of you and all of that. And he took two hours to give me the lowdown of what was happening at that point in my career. Name a three-star that would just do that. General Vetri would. 
and here I am today. And he's a school teacher now in Pays, Florida, running a high school, right? That's just the kind of person he is. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Okay, who's next? Yep. Thank you, Mikhail, Cadet Third Class. What initially inspired you to join the Air Force, and what job did you initially want? Okay, so I know most of you heard earlier this morning that I was, I'm originally from Ecuador, and I shared how, because the way I look, and my culture is not supposed to be in the military. So, but even when I was growing up, I always said, you know, the commercial, um, and, and there was something that always caught my attention about the uniform. Um, so when I got to New York, did high school and all that stuff, and I kept seeing it more and more. Uh, it's just something in me just kind of like, it kind of light up the, the fire again of being in the military. So um, I, I went and talked to the recruiter, and like I told you guys, I didn't tell my parents, especially my dad. Um, but it just, it gave, me, it gave me a sense of purpose when I went and talked to the recruiter that I could be part of something bigger and most important, kind of give back to, yes, it may sound cheesy, but yes, I'm one of those that is serving because I wanted to give back to this country for the opportunity to offer it to my family and I. That, that's why, and I'm still here. I'm um, still loving it. Um, and career field, uh, I knew I wanted to come in uh, personnel, so I spent a lot of time studying, and that was the only area that I concentrated. And I told the recruiter, I'm not gonna, because I, I have to wait like six months to come in. I was in the delay enlistment program, that's what it's called. Because I told him, he's like, well, we can get you in tomorrow. I said, no. The only way that I would join the Air Force is you can sign the contract and saying that I will come in and guarantee personnel because that's something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. so, and I waited, what, almost seven months? So. Well, Chief was way smarter than I was. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know what. OK, you two, why did I join the Air Force? It's not glamorous. So you go ahead and tell them. Um, to get out of South Dakota. Yep. To travel more. Yep. And to further education. And my parents were broke, right? So for me, it was, it was the, I don't know what else I'm gonna do. I, I was a high honor student, so it wasn't grades. It was, I thought my parents were broke, and my girlfriend bet me a Coke that I wouldn't go talk to the recruiter. I wanted a Coke. <laughs> okay, so what job did I want? No kidding, I'm not lying. I had no idea. So I went and tested. They said I tested out high on the, you know what an ASVAB is? Yes, I tested out high on mechanics for the ASVAB, and they go, we got a job for you. And I'm like, okay. So I went in open general into basic training, because I really didn't know. And then the way I chose my job, I am so not the example for you guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the way I chose my job was the one that gave me six months worth of skiing in Denver. So I became an avionics technician because I could ski for six months in Denver. And I didn't care what job I had, honestly, right? And so after that, I went to Las I got interviewed, and I went and worked on the Stealth 117 um, when it was still black. I got interviewed and selected, and I went into Las Vegas. Ha, <laughs> right? Denver and Las Vegas? Yes, right? Party on. And so that's how I started. Yeah. I had no clue what I was doing. How many of you, is this your first foray into the military, you had no family, no connection with the military before this. Yeah, so it's kind of mystifying, right? And you kind of don't have any expectations. You just kind of wait till they give you a cookie and said, hey, go do this job, right? Okay, right? <laughs> and you're kind of along for the ride. Well, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do that because you've got brilliance in the back of the room. I just kind of hung out, right? And it worked out for me. You can get into this Air Force and not have a clue what you want to do. And somebody will get you to where you need to go because of those, those individuals there. I'm surprised maybe you didn't end up with security forces. As <laughs> as it's only a month. It's only a month, right? Yeah. So that was going to be San Antonio too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That wasn't anywhere near skiing. No. <laughs> no. Okay, what's next? Yes, please. Uh, Cadet Kendrick, uh, AS400. How did you sign up uh, commissioning after you enlisted for six years? Eight. Eight, excuse me. Okay, this is again not a glorious story. I hate this because I really should have some inspirational thing to tell you. Um, so after I did the four years of the F-117, I was in love with Ed Mayer. I was Leslie Jacobson at the time, and Ed Mayer had stole my heart, and he got orders to Wichita. 
So I ditched my Air Force career, got out, separated, and decided to go to college so I could follow Ed Mayer to Wichita from Las Vegas. That's how much in love I was, okay? Hmm. So I get there, and the guard knows when people get out of the Air Force, okay? And so the recruiters came to me and said, hey, we hear you want to go to school. We heard you got accepted to Wichita State because it was on my separation paperwork. Um, over the summer, would you like to pick up some guard duty and come join us, right? Where they were F4s, F16s, and stuff. And I'm like, shh, what am I doing all summer, right? Sure, I'll come join you. I kind of enjoy being in uniform. So I joined traditional, and no kidding, I wasn't there two weeks before they offered me an AGR tour. Does anybody know what that is? Tell them. What's uh, an AGR? Active tour? Guard Reserve. Active Guard Reserve. So I have my green ID card back. You'll see a green ID card tomorrow. You'll know what I'm talking about. And then uh, I got hired on full-time as an AGR. And they let me work at night full-time so I could go to school as a full-time student during the day at Wichita State, like, a, like you guys, right? Didn't know anything about ROTC, so that didn't hit me. Okay, so I promise I'm getting to my point. So at the end of four years, I'm getting ready to graduate. I'm in year three, junior. Ed Mayer comes home from his job of being active duty at McConnell. And uh, we were across the runway from each other, guard on one side, active duty on the other. And he goes, you're not going to believe this. I got orders to Italy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. So how many guard units are in Italy? I'm like, dang it. And I was going to be a chief. I was like making rank, right? I had just gotten selected for master sergeant. Um, I was just waiting to put it on. I had put tech sergeant on. And I was like, I'm going to make chief. And then now I'm not going to make chief because I can't fall. And I was, I was still madly in love with him. We weren't married yet. And then, um, so, <laughs> so um, I called the recruiter. And I said, hey, can I take a bust in rank and come back into active duty? Um, as a, I'll come in as a senior airman. I was ready to negotiate that low. I'll come in as a senior airman. There was a hiring freeze, and they wouldn't take me. But the recruiter, being very savvy, goes, hey, I'm going to pass you to somebody. Because have you ever thought about becoming an officer? You're 18 credit hours from being done, and we're hiring navigators. You've got this experience behind you of being a maintainer and personnel by that point. And I'm like, oh, no, that sounds good. Right? So I followed that bread trail. I called my husband up, who was in Italy at this time, and he goes, I said, you got two shots to say no. I'm thinking about becoming an officer. He goes, yeah, that sounds good. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you got another shot. This is what it would be. And he still said yes. So I went to OTS. Uh, my guard unit happily put letters forward. So either they were really trying to get rid of me or they, they loved me. I hope it's that they love me because they gave me glowing letters of recommendation and I came back in that way. So for six months between my guard time and my officer time, I was an Air Force spouse, a dependent spouse while my husband was in the Bosnia and Herzegovina um, fight over in Italy. And so I got to spend five months in Italy, get refreshed, came back to OTS. They started yelling at me about my shoelaces not being tucked into my shoes. I looked at my car. I'm like, I could go back to Italy right now instead of yelling about my shoelaces. But I crossed the blue line, and here I am. And so, yep. Not glamorous. Not the way you'd expect. But guess what? Every one of your airmen that you're going to encounter probably has a story as crazy and disjointed as that one. But you stay because of service. You stay because you almost feel naked when you don't have this on. And so 34 years later, the crookedest road possible, I've got to have a pretty cool career. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank you. I scared you guys. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you had any recommendations or anything like that for people to balance life in the military with their family, mm -hmm. especially since you have a joint spouse situation. I did, yeah. I'm still trying to figure that out. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I'm serious. I'm still figuring that out. I do have set up some, uh, not, I'm not going to say rules, but boundary, and General Mayor is amazing about that. Um, when I get home, I put my work phone in the kitchen, I leave that there. Um, I check my emails twice a day during the weekend, and if it is not an emergency, I will take care of it on Monday. Um, I try to be, when I'm home, I try to be home to be with my family to build those memories like I told you guys earlier. But honestly, I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah. <laughs>
Captain Jones, how balanced am I? <laughs> Very balanced, ma'am. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so not, right? Yeah. So not. Well, um, go ahead. Will have sacrificed so for the better good of her family. She has left them in Florida, and she travels. She'll drive. Didn't you drive before your PT test, ma'am? Three hours from Florida to Montgomery on like a Monday morning or something and took her PT test. So she makes sacrifices for the family life, but it's not balanced. So we joke. <laughs> we, she's so right, right? So we joke. Do um, you guys know anything about accident investigation? You guys do, right? Okay. So when an accident happens, let's just say that we torpedo an F-16 into the ground and it, it requires us to go back in and find out what happened. So what happens is, is once we figure out that it's not a mechanical failure, which is um, pretty easy, that happens in almost the first five days of the accident investigation, where do we turn our focus? To the and his human factors, or her human factors. I gotta tell you, if there was ever an aircraft accident about me, I am worried about what my physics would have to say, right? Because they'd be like, did the person get enough sleep? No, nope, not since my kid Luke was born uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> Probably not, right? I live on about six and a half, if that's it. But um, yeah, about six and a half, to be real. Um, do I work out enough? I think I do okay there, to be honest. I think uh, I'm hitting it about five days a week consistently. And I love about the four and a half to five mile run. I try to do two days of weights and we get that done. But when do I do it? I do it at five in the morning because I am not the type that can leave work, go work out, and then come back. It just doesn't work for me. Um, if they asked if I ate right, uh, yeah, my, the staff will tell you I have a no cake rule, no cake in the office because I hate sugar being around me because um, I'll gobble it up in a heartbeat. Um, so no cake rule, but I try to eat as healthy as I can, but I'm about a meal and a half person a day when I'm not traveling. Traveling? Oh yeah. I'll settle up to that table for every meal you put in front of me. When I'm not traveling, I try to do about a meal and a half. Um, do I have this disjointed thing between Florida where my family is and Montgomery where I work? Yep. But I've got great bosses that allow me to do that so that my kids can be in there finalized. But I will tell you that probably the best part of balance is where are you up here? Okay, so those are all physical things. Where are you at up here? If it wasn't for my circle of office, right, my execs, my chief, my first sergeant, my JAG, my CAG, my pastor, my chaplain, I would be out of balance. I come back from meetings ready to eat through my chair because I have just not won the argument. I told you guys, win-lose, right? I'm a win-lose person, um, and I'm frustrated. So let's say that an airman comes in and they need to talk to me right after that happens. That's probably not so good for that airman, right? And so that circle I just talked about, they allow me to do a spin out so that I can get my head right again and I can approach that airman in the right frame of mind to, to go after. Yesterday, we had a pretty rough two hours where it was a very unsatisfying conversation with a parent and a former cadet. And then I went to lunch right away with the detachment at OSU. That didn't go so well, that lunch because I hadn't had a chance to take these two ladies and go ah! right <laughs> and get that out of my system. And I really had a tough time concentrating during lunches on a cadre that deserved my full attention. So when you go to set up your offices, you're gonna have a senior enlisted with you. If you're good, right? You better go get that senior enlisted. That should be a standard for you. Don't choose that, that should be your standard. You're gonna have people that are your network, your peers, someplace safe, that you can go get this out, right? So that you can approach every situation after that, solid, solid. There's gonna be days where you're highly frustrated, somebody's gotta get that out of you, right? Help you get that out of you. If you keep it in, that's the balance, that's the imbalance I worry about the most. Toxic work environments are built on people not being able to maintain a stable mental frame. So, there you go. Yep. Anything I said that I should modify there? Okay. Yeah.
Yeah, I don't want you guys to have to clean up too much when I leave, right? <laughs> All right. And who's next? I just scared you all, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, that answer was scary for anybody, I can imagine. Yep. Yes, please. Man, that was a construction there. Uh, you've been in for 34 years. How have you compared different administrations, different changes on the world? Oh, my history? gosh. That is a fantastic question. Do we have one more coaster left? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Best question I think I've been asked this week. You deserve a coaster for that. <laughs> so yeah, it's crazy too, okay? Um, just to be honest, right? Because we stay pretty stable. We know how to handle change. I mean, you're going to have different commanders, right? That's going to kind of feel like a different administration when it comes through. But we just kind of absorb it, figure it out, and truck off, right? But when it's the president, that I would say the craziest part is how the Pentagon acts and the urgency that comes with getting that new administration in. So I was in the Pentagon during President Trump's administration. Do you guys remember some of the things that were going on during that time at the Pentagon? Can anybody name some of those things? Go ahead. And ISIS pretty much spread over the entire Middle East. Yeah, we were dealing with that. Um, how was he with his staff? Firing everybody about every two weeks. Yeah, so how many secretaries of defense did we go through in his time? Four. Yeah. Right? That's tough, right? And if you guys know General Mattis, and you guys probably don't have the same connection that we do, but General Mattis, right? I mean, you want to talk about probably a general we all would aspire to be. Just solid. Can talk to anybody. Make them feel special. I mean, his units were just legendary, right? And so for him to leave, that kind of rocks you a little bit as a military member. And his name was the gold standard in DC. When everything else was being crazy, the Department of Defense was solid. And so that got tough, to be honest, right? Not because of anything to do with President Trump's policy decisions or anything like that, but the effects that some of his decisions had as it rippled down to us. How did we do on the budget during his time? Great. No, budget was great. <laughs> It was something we could count on. The military did fantastic. It went up by 50 billion. That buys a lot of F-35s. <laughs> and with space coming on board, how many of you guys think that was the right decision? I sure do, right? I mean, how many times do you guys use space before you even get your first cup of coffee? Do you know? Probably about six times. And you don't even know. That's how good space is. But yet, we had under-resourced them for a long time. And as long as we needed new fighters and we needed new electronic warfare weapon systems, a new bomber, a new tanker, where's space in that lineup? It's that invisible thing that just works. So it wasn't getting the attention it needed. That was great. Would we have gotten that under another administration? I don't know. We made treaties more during President Obama's administration. The international partnership had a whole new feeling. And so, yes, the answer is yes. The administration changes really will affect your life as you go up in rank. Your airmen, ah, and I'm gonna say this in a way that I hope you understand my sense. Your airmen will probably be shielded from it a bit. But that was before social media. Mm -hmm. So now, I don't think that statement holds as true as it did when I was an airman. When I was an airman, I was like, who's president? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Does it affect my paycheck? Okay, good. I'm good. <laughs> Do what you want. I didn't even vote for president for so long because, again, I'm going to serve for whoever's commander in chief. I now vote. Because I, I am older, more mature, I know what I'm voting for. But as an airman, I was like, I'm going to have a job tomorrow. Rock on. Whoever's president, you're, 
Not the right attitude. Again, I, I'm telling you, I will stand here and tell you, I am not the glorious example you want me to be. I am not. But I am real with you. And, you know, so this is where my career is led. But I have definitely watched how my military has acted under different administrations. And it has been a twisted story. And so we just got to keep working to be better as a Department of Defense. And then hope we can absorb the shocks that come from the presidential administration that comes from there. Okay? So do solid advice, best military advice. That is your job. No matter who asks you, your job as an officer is best military advice. Even when it's not popular. And I think your boss, your deck commander, could give you lots of YouTube videos where officers got into really sticky situations upholding that charge of best military advice. Yep. Okay. Who's next? That was kind of heavy. A good question. Now I definitely need to ask you where I need to clean up. <laughs> yeah. At the Sonal AS 400, ma'am, what is something you wish you had done better early on in your career? Or maybe even later in your career? <laughs> oh, gee. <sighs> Probably going back to one of your uh, teammates' question was balance. Yeah. I will tell you, I missed a lot of special uh, moments with my kids and my husband. Try and probably be a little more selfish with my, my family time. I wish I'd have honestly been less arrogant about the accession's mission and the Air and Education Training Command mission. So growing up, I wanted to be the best navigator of the tankers I could be. I wanted to be the best uh, person to defend the budget, facilities, commander, you name it, right? Foreign area officer. And I always kind of poo-pooed this mission over here. Yeah. I was like, Phew. I don't go to ROTCs and train. That's somebody else's job. I was an idiot. This is where the rubber hits the road. And it took me 32 years to figure that out. So I am your staunchest report, um, supporter right now. I go to promotion boards just to tell the story of how valuable this mission of shaping you is. So I apologize to you publicly for being arrogant, because I was. Yep. And uh, now, after I retire, guess what I'm going to go do? Anybody know? Ski. Oh my <laughs> gosh, wouldn't that be great? I'm at the beach now. I gave up the mountains. I'm going to be a high school teacher. I'm going to go teach ELA at the high school in Santa Rosa County. I'm going to start off my internship at Gulf Breeze High School. And I'm going to continue to serve in that way. That way I can be with my kids as well. I am not taking for granted what it takes to get you to this point anymore. And I'm going to go be a part of it. <laughs> All right. What else? We have about five minutes to leave and we'll have you here. So. All right. You guys get one more? Yes, please, ma'am. Ma'am, um, Cadet Taylor Cross, AS100. Mm -hmm. Out of the core values of the Air Force, which one do you think either relates to you the most or is the best one to give advice based off of to new officers? Say that first part again. Um, out of the four core values, or not four, sorry, three, three, three core values, yep. yeah. <laughs> um, which one do you think relates to you, your career, your aspirations the most? For me, personally, Leslie Mayer, I think I do excellence in all we do first. That's probably my, my forte, not first, my forte. The one that I feel my Air Force as a whole struggles with the most is service before self. And let me tell you why. Because we compete for rank, we compete for awards, we compete for resources, we compete for talent, and then there comes a point where you realize like, oh, this family that I came in the Air Force with, 
I want to have that family at the end, and I've kind of gotten out of balance with all of my compete that I've done. And you sometimes break your family, and in that fear to not break your family, sometimes you get so focused on the things that you've jacked up along the way that you start to position yourself and your jobs for yourself where the Air Force might not need you the most. So how many of you guys are excited about getting your career field? Right? You're not all raising your hand? Come on. Okay, so how many of you would like to go to Hawaii? Y'all aren't raising your hands? Come on. Right? Everybody wants to go to Hawaii. But it's not best for the Air Force, let's say. Your best job would be Minot, North Dakota. <laughs> How many want to go to Minot, North Dakota? <laughs> you don't all want to go to Minot? Okay. But I will tell you, the Air Force needs you there. So this oath that you signed up said service before self, right? That you would defend and protect the Constitution, right? All that stuff, right? And sometimes we need you to go somewhere. And there's a reason we need you to go somewhere is because your unique talents need to be there. Or your job needs to be there. So there's going to be this point, and we all face it. We all face it, where service before self gets to be self before service. I personally am struggling with a colonel right now who has got that completely out of whack. And I'm trying to slowly bring him around. You're going to have airmen that are going to have that out of whack. Got to get that around. You guys heard me talk about my story about I joined for all the wrong reasons, right? Money, get out of South Dakota, all those things you just listed for me. But why do you stay? Because I'm ready to take a bullet for you. I'm ready to take a bullet for you. If you can't say that and mean it, you haven't quite got that where you've joined the Air Force. You're just in the Air Force. So work on that, right? Identify it when it happens. Talk about it in your small group. We have airman's time now, right? It's airman's time where we're supposed to get in small groups according to the chief and talk through those human dynamics. Find out about what's bugging you. Find out what you're doing secretly on the side that you're not supposed to be doing. You know, <laughs> find out who you're seeing, right? That's what airman time is about, is making those connections. So that if Ron walks in the door one day because you're angry about something or something's worried about you, you're worried about something, I can identify it right now. And I can go, hey, how was your weekend? Knowing that I really want to dig in there and get nosy with you and find out what's bugging you. You got to get that good with your own. That when Ron walks in the door, you can go, that doesn't look right. And you can go get after it. That way you can bring that member back into the team the way you need to. Yep. It's good stuff. This is the best job. I can stand here and tell you that. As jacked up as my situation is, it's the best job for me. I am hooked on this. I'm an Air Force groupie. I'm going to be supporting you from afar. And I'm going to get the ELA scores up, those verbal scores up, so that you get good airmen, that you get great officers coming behind you. That's my 10-foot path I'm going to go clean, OK? And so, um, OK. I always like to end up with a little bit of feedback. What feedback do you have for Chief and I before I got to walk? No kidding. I want to be better for you. If you've got something that you want to tell me that I can do to be better, I would absolutely love to hear it. So if you're a little bit worried about saying it in public because I'm a general, um, <laughs> you can tell your deck commander, and uh, I would absolutely invite that, OK? Because Olivia's going to pull me out of here right now. She's like, come on, just end it. Thank you so much for hosting us today. It has been, no kidding, a rewarding experience. And I absolutely, the best part of my trip is yet to come, where you guys show us what you can do tomorrow at that retirement. Are you guys excited about that? <laughs> How many have seen ceremonies like that before? Yeah, not very many? Yeah, enjoy it tomorrow. It is the epitome of why we are a close-knit group and what binds us and distinguishes us from the rest of the world. Enjoy it, all right? Thank you.